I'm very happy to be here and talking to you. And obviously this is a book about one of the most famous people in the world about whom we know very little. There's a paradox for a start. Um, the conceit of this book really is that I, I felt that I wanted to write a book about the queen that no one else could write. That seems possibly an arrogant claim, but let me explain it. Um, she and I happened to have been in our respective lines of business for about the same time. The Queen's been on the throne for 70 years and I've been in journalism for the same time. And so just by pure chance, my whole career as a journalist has spanned her career as a Queen. And I felt then I could take a look at her, not through the lens of a normal biography, but through the lens of someone who intermittently through the whole course of her reign has either written pieces about her or the monarchy itself or assign other people to write pieces or to do stuff on television about her. So it's, it's like a, a culmination, the book, I'm looking back to the beginning and then looking back at my own career and relationship with the monarchy and my own feelings about the monarchy. And I chose to, to see the Queen through the viewpoint of some of the major crises in her life. And I think it's important to remember we're not talking about the Netflix series, The Crown, in which you may feel already familiar with all the people who are impersonating the members of the royal family on television. I want to try to, the book is basically the real, the real version, if you like, of The Crown. And The Crown has taken liberties with the facts in, in a number of cases, but I still think The Crown is a very important way of acquainting people with the whole phenomenon of the monarchy. So when the Queen's father died in 1952, she came to the throne as a very, very young and inexperienced woman who had, had led a, a relatively, a very sheltered life, in fact, mostly within the confines of the royal family. And the coronation occurred a year later in 1953. It was a deliberately staged national pageant because the country at that time in 1953, the United Kingdom was still a very, wounded country from all the after effects of the Second World War. It was a time of great austerity. There's not much to make people feel happy about. And so I think that the, the institution of the monarchy and in the person of this young queen offered itself as a way, if you like, of rebranding both the country and the monarchy. So somewhat foolishly, this was promoted as the new Elizabethan age this young Elizabeth coming to the throne and her 17th century forebear, Elizabeth I, um, was, a, was a, a somewhat inflated reference because anyone who knows anything about English history understands that Elizabeth I was a remarkable woman who came to, also came to the throne very young and the country then had a population of only 4 million people. And in the span of 45 years, Elizabeth I transformed it from a splintered country into a major world power because of the skill of her statecraft. So this young woman comes onto the throne in 1953, um, looking very glamorous. It was the first time a coronation had ever been televised. So it was making the monarchy much more accessible than it had ever been before. It was a flickering primitive black and white picture but it was still a, a dramatic piece of theatre and that's that's what the Queen found herself in a, a situation which she, she would find herself in many times later as a, being essentially the central character in a piece of national theatre and so expectations were set very high for her at that moment and she was very fortunate in that when she came to the throne the Prime Minister was Winston Churchill and I think it's quite reassuring and remarkable to the British people even today that they have someone on the throne who goes way back to the time of Winston Churchill, obviously one of the greatest historical figures the country's ever produced. And this was a relationship between an old, older Churchill and this very young queen in which he played mentor. And in fact, she got on with Winston Churchill. She's had 14 prime ministers so far. He was the first and the relationship between the two of them was I think, and by all evidence, a far stronger one than she's ever had with any prime minister since. There's an upside to that and there's a downside to that. The upside is that it enabled the young queen 
to become very confident of what was expected of her as she explored how much of herself she had to present to the country and how she had to present the person of the queen itself because fundamentally the monarchy rests on a mystique a mystique that overtakes the actual reality of the person on the throne and is meant to represent something far greater than that person the the head of state and the inheritor of a monarchy that stretched over many centuries so the monarch is expected to embody essential characteristics of the country that the country can recognize but at the same time this is a democratic um, country with parliamentary government and in theory and in fact the monarch has no power so anything that happens in the daily life in the daily routine of the monarch has to support this mystique and i don't think the queen has ever separated from the responsibility of representing that mystique and the mystique is in a sense it's um one of a person who lives in a very verified unreal world uh that, you, that people are, are originally in the 1950s in awe of the people now and we'll get we'll get to this later the people are far less in awe of the monarch and the institution now than they were then and as a journalist it struck me at the time at the beginning of the monarchy that there was far too much um uh, reverence and uncritical support for the institution regardless of who actually represented it uh, than there should have been that the, the the coverage was a very fawning and sycophantic coverage and by today's media standards extremely respectful and primitive there were no such things as uh, as um, obviously as, as consi consistent tabloid pursuit of the royal family every day nothing like that happened so the queen had had to mature under the tutelage of a, of a great man like Winston Churchill she had to also understand her education it's interesting that the queen's always complained that her, she didn't have a very good education her education was was focused on one thing the amorphous nature of the British constitution and her place within the British constitution and her duty to exercise her place. And I think she had from the very start and still does a very acute sense of that duty. The education that she had therefore focused on what, what was around her own life and her own role. And she felt, I know because she said this to people later that she wasn't sufficiently educated in the wider world and she, was in a position to acquire an education in politics because she had a constant flow of official documents every day which she viewed every day for the, the red box that goes to Buckingham Palace and still does every day with all the official papers in it she goes through them and then returns them she she, she may make comments but she can't have any opinions about them and she's detached from that that responsibility so I want you to think of that young woman then as she was then an apprentice in a very commanding and demanding job and the woman now age 94 as she is now and recognize the enormous journey that she's taken through those those decays and I tend to, to split her reign into three parts about the first third of it is where she is still to a large extent the apprentice the second third of it is where she really matures and feels much more confident and has adapted to the changing circumstances of the country itself and the last third brings us up up to now where she is a what she's achieved is that she's acquired authority without power now this is a hell of a trick okay you ask what kind of authority is it well it, it's the authority that you earn it's the authority of your person able to deliver uh, a sense of, if you like, what the destiny and role of the country is. Her, her authority is a, a maternal authority. It's like she's become the mother of the nation in the best possible way, in that she's a very, as we saw in the year of the coronavirus, 
when she made a spectacular appearance on Palm Sunday and made a broadcast to the people, she was emollient and reassuring. And to become that figure, she referred deliberately back to the Second World War and they put up a little bit of black and white film of her and her sister Margaret talking on the BBC in 1940 to all the Brits, particularly the people of London who'd been evacuated to all parts of the country to escape the Brits and even evacuated to parts of the Commonwealth too. So there was a, at that time for her and for the country, there was a great sense of desperation. The war was only in its early stages and by far short of winning. There was no sureness that we would win because we were still alone in the world then facing off Hitler was before the United States came into the war. So everything that the Queen resembles now, in a way echoes back to that time in that she reflects the memory of that in the same way that I have a memory of it too. I have an acute memory of, 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 I was a kid at the time, but I do have a very sharp memory of how beleaguered the country was and yet how united it was, how spectacularly united it was. And that unity was largely the work of Churchill. So when it came to this Queen understanding how you unite a country, she did have the greatest tutor for that then. And so in 2020, when it came to another grave hour in the experience of the nation, she was able to summon that spirit and she used a very deliberately uh, 1940s term, we will meet again, meaning that although everyone has been separated and she like us now tonight was in virtual contact with the country, that she, she was able to summon that, that spirit of 1940 back and reassure people. Now, that's what I mean by authority. It's a kind of, it's not an intellectual authority so much as an emotional authority. It's very hard for it, politicians on the whole, when they try to appeal to the spirit of the country, have a hard time because one knows that they're a politician and they're only there for a, a certain period, a certain term and they may be exploiting that association for their own ends. In the case of the current queen, we know she's not exploiting it for any other end than to make people feel confident and better. And so she is able to send someone a, a sense of what it means to be British under these circumstances. And the other thing I, 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 that I've traced through these three separate decades of the queen's reign, which I think is very important, is that she's had to manage a period of consistent national decline, not national decline in terms of character or spirit or creativity, certainly not that, but national decline in terms of world power. After all, she begins in 1953 with the remnant of what's left of the world's greatest empire. And she ends in 2020 with what's left of that after Brexit, which is a very curious, I have to say, very peculiar piece of behavior of self-harm by the Brits of withdrawing from Europe and pretending to be a sovereign power independent again on this little island offshore island so it's a temperamental thing which I don't really understand and we, we this is an indication of how little we understand or know about the Queen because none of us knows to this moment what she really feels about Brexit and she won't obviously tell anybody and we won't find that out until the papers are published so here's 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 that this arc and in the history of Britain, we've had these three queens. We had Elizabeth I, who basically created the first nation state of, of the United Kingdom as we know it. And at the end of her reign, she said that it was 45 years, she said she'd hoped she'd achieved what she wanted to achieve, which is to serve her subjects as best she could. This is the daughter of Henry VIII, by the way, who was one of the most notorious King monarchs we ever had, who was, was a great uh, statesman in himself, but completely bonkers in so many other ways. And his daughter was was so so shy. So we had this was the first thing we had Queen Victoria, who was the queen at the apogee of the British Empire, when the British Empire was basically covered the earth more or less. And now we have Elizabeth II presiding over the steady dissolution. I think is a polite word to use it, the dissolution of the British Empire, the transformation of the colonies into the British Commonwealth, which is something she cares enormously about. And she was very much ahead of the movement to liberate the colonies in Africa. She's, she's very attached to Africa and she's written a very strong attachment, partly I think because when she got the news of her father's death 
1952, she was in Africa uh, with, with Prince Philip. Um, and they, she's always had this very strong attachment to the country. And I think she's been in many ways ahead of many of her prime ministers un in understanding the importance of, of African independence and the, and the Commonwealth of uh, independent, all the Commonwealth countries too. The Commonwealth is a vast system that combines all sorts of different kind of regimes, some of them not very wholesome and some of them very wholesome. And she's always been a, a very good figurehead for that. So now we're, we're talking about someone who's come all this way, that the power of, she's managed the idea of decline as best she could, not always, as I say in my book, not always understanding fully what that meant. Um, if I've been critical, the most critical parts of my book, I think, are where, I, where the Queen has been in step generally with the idea of diminished world power and empire power. She's been less sure of herself in the vast changes that have taken place in the culture of the country. And I do go into this to, because something I was party to myself as part of a great revolution in, in journalism and a revolution in television where we were conscious of the fact that the monarchy at various times seemed a great lumbering anachronism that was costing the country vast amounts of money while not returning any value for the money spent. And that's been a constant core, cause of criticism throughout the Queen's reign. And she's risen, risen above that for most of the time. It's the other members of the family have done damage to that more than the Queen herself. But she was, um, she had a wonderful phrase that she used a few years ago to, to describe what she, what she felt her custodianship of the country meant. And she said that she wasn't interested in ephemeral change. She was interested in only permanent change. And I know what she meant, it was kind of code for many prime ministers who've come to, the, come to office promising substantial, wonderful, transformational change, very little of which has ever happened. Where, whereas the queen has, has understood the need for modest change. I think some of the, certainly early on in the 1960s, the royal family was way behind the culture changes that were taking place, the, the sweeping aside of, of censorship of theater and film and literature was something that took them off guard. And it took, the royal family in a way is a member of the, they're members of the ruling class, but they're not, not members of the aristocracy. So there's a deeply embedded separate aristocracy in the country, still there, a lot of old buffers, they don't have any power anymore, but they're still there as a kind of freak show. And then there are the members of the royal family who, who act as though they're members of the aristocracy, but are sometimes regarded uh, by the real ar aristocracy as, uh, as um, Johnny come lately, uh, because these were, this was a German family, the Hanoverians who, who, who ruled both pieces of Germany and, um, and the United Kingdom in the 18th century. And so they're still <laughs> regarded by the old light aristocracy as parvenus. Now you may find this that kind of crazy and quaint, but, it, but there's a kind of snobbery there. And this, this connects in a way to Princess Diana because the Spencer family that Diana belongs to goes back much further than any member of, of, the, of the Hanoverian royal family goes back. So that's part of the, the Diana story, which is a whole separate drama that we know a lot about, obviously, and I deal with in the book. So um, when, it, when it comes to understanding the management of decline, she's also trying to grapple with how the monarchy adapts to those changes. And she's, on the whole, done it grudgingly. E each time it's, it's been necessary to shed some of the costs and and trappings of the monarchy. She's done it reluctantly, like giving up the royal yacht, Britannia, for example, she was very reluctant to do that, giving up the sort of private airline that the royal family had, uh, an RAF royal flight of small airliners that they used, and other, other luxuries that they had. So there's been a reluctance to do that. But on the whole, I would say um, her greatest trick really is for her to now appear to be completely classless. She, the, Elizabeth II is, is in a class of her own. She's not regarded as a, as a member of the aristocracy and she's not regarded as a toff of any kind. She's regarded as a very classy, in the best sense of that word, 
a very classy woman, a person of great dignity, who's carried off a great role. And then I, I come back really to where I started this conversation, which is that it's amazing. It was amazing to me going back all these years and nearly 70 decades of her rule to realize that we know really so little of the private life, the inner person of the queen. Um, so I'm not pretending in this book any more than any other author of a book about the monarch and the royal family. I'm not pretending that I know more about the queen than I know. And all the, all the um, royal whisperers that you'll find reading in the papers and the magazines who pretend that they know, they don't know either. I mean, there's, there's a whole community of people whose job it is to cover the royal family who are covering it with the most threadbare of sources and the most fragile pieces of information. So what I've tried to do in my book is to rely on, and the book, I had my book fact-checked by someone who was, knows the Queen very well. So in terms of the accuracy of the parts of it that refer to her, I'm very confident. It's interesting because this person whose name I can't reveal because they know the Queen so well, they had big disputes with me over my interpretation and analysis and commentary but I left them no room to have disputes with me over fact. So where we parted ways really comes about through my feeling that where she's slipped behind public opinion and, and been slow to make the changes that I think she should have agreed to. But otherwise I still came away thinking that even though I know so little about the inner life of the queen that she's a, remarkable, she's a remarkable woman who's pulled off an amazing achievement. The one constancy through seven extremely turbulent decades, turbulent in terms of the life of the monarch in the royal family and turbulent in terms of the life of the country. So there is a, there is a villain in this book and this is a very interesting aspect of the book, I think, in that the queen only became totally sure and confident of herself on the death of Lord Louis, otherwise known as Dicky Mountbatten, who died uh, with an IRA assassination in 1979. And until 1979, Mountbatten exercised a great deal of what I think was quite malign influence on the life of the royal family and the life of the Queen, which is expressed in my book most clearly by the story of how from a very early time of the Queen's reign, he fought to get the name of the family changed from Windsor to Mountbatten, Windsor, because he was an atavist. He wanted to go back to the German roots of his own and Prince Philip's family. Now, uh, Mountbatten was the mentor to Prince Philip and he groomed Prince Philip. He, he more or less personally chose Prince Philip to be the Queen's husband early on when Philip was a naval cadet and because the Navy was Mountbatten's own place as well he was able to to groom Philip at the same time and he had a decisive influence over the education of Philip. He had him educated at this strange place called Gordonstown in Scotland which was a kind of um, almost like a military academy, a very Spartan place. And we'll come to the question of Prince Charles because obviously he was educated in the same way at the same place. So when, um, when <coughs> Philip married the queen, he was already indoctrinated by Mountbatten into the idea that they should do this weird thing of changing the family name and Philip, Here's a paradox about Prince Philip. In one way, he's, he's passing himself off as a very modern man, a man who wants to change everything inside Buckingham Palace, rip through all the stuffy old goats who run Buck, 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 Buckingham Palace, who he hates and quite rightly hates when he, when he gets to live in there. So he's a revolutionary man. He, he was the one who had the idea of televising the coronation, which was such a terrific idea. So on the one, the one side of Philip's brain, there is the the modern man. On the other side, he's been um, persuaded by his uncle Dickie Mountbatten that 
they should restore the German link to the family. Now, the German link was removed in 1917 for, for political reasons in the First World War, because in 1917, when George V was on the throne, they wanted to eliminate all the German associations and present the royal family as patriotic Brits with, with suddenly cast off all their German links. Um, and so the, the, the name Windsor was chosen. So I don't understand, and it's a lot of other people don't understand with me why Philip and, and, and Mountbatten wanted to do this, but they did. And Philip was so insistent on it that it brought the Queen to actually to tears. And over 10 years, he fought for this to happen. And it was finally executed by Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who described in his memoirs how shocked he was to find how brutal, which was the word that he used, Philip was being to get the family name changed to Mountbatten Windsor. And it was changed in such a way that it can be adopted only by members so low down in the line of succession that they don't have any chance of succeeding to the throne, which is why when Prince Archie was born to Meghan and Harry, he is Archie Mountbatten Windsor. So he's one of the first people to carry that, tie, that ancient title with the German connection. The other thing I want to say about the Queen before I throw this open to questions and discussion is that the royal line, the royal family and the monarchy could have driven over the cliff much earlier than this had it not been for the fact that the Queen and her father were exceptions to the rule of the quality of the monarch, not norms, because the three preceding kick monarchs to the Queen's father, Edward VII, George V, and Edward VIII were all deeply flawed people. Edward VII uh, succeeded his mother after a long time in waiting and was a deplorably depraved and uh, indulged person, totally unfit to be a king. Nonetheless, he gave his name to a whole era, the Edwardian era, and certainly was in no way a modern man. George V succeeded him, was a, 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 a blimpish, very limited man who was aware that he was not really up to the job, had an evil temper, was terrible as a father, had terrible rages at the, at the family table, where so bad that the Queen would get up and walk out with with the children. He had these four sons, one of whom became Edward VIII and had the abdication, who was a very inadequate king. And luckily, but for us, his younger brother um, succeeded and became George VI. And in fact, the Queen's father was a bit wobbly at first. Um, before the, uh, the onset of the Second World War, he asked Churchill whether it was a wise idea to wage war against the fascists when he felt that the Bolsheviks were a far greater threat, which was a, a view generally held by members of the upper class and the aristocracy right up until the 1940s. And in fact, his younger brother, the Duke of Kent, had been a very forceful force for making some kind of peace deal with Hitler. Um, but George VI grew very rapidly in the role of king during the war and became an exemplary king. And he was a very important part of informing his daughter what was required of a monarch. So if it hadn't been for George the, George the VI and the Queen, the monarchy might have gone over the cliff a lot earlier. Uh, and in fact, it was in great danger of going over the cliff at the time of the abdication when it was held in wide disrepute. And so this is another thing I would say about the Queen is, is that because she's been on the throne for so long, she has sustained the idea and longevity of the institution itself far beyond where it might otherwise have gone. Therefore, I think that when we approach the question of her succession, it's a very different ball game with a very dubious um, successor in the form of Prince Charles. Um, I think that's all I have to say at the moment. Sounds good. Well, we already have a lot of questions um, coming in. So if you don't mind, we'll get started with some of those. All right. Um, Carol would like to know how old Elizabeth was when she became queen. Um, good question. I think she was 23 when she became queen. Um, 
Okay, we have another question who would like to know, would the UK have been different had Elizabeth been a son? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, and this, this speaks to something about the Queen's character and her, her failings as a mother too, in, in a way, in that um, the Queen was brought up uh, without any brothers. And I think that when it came to the education of her own sons, they made a terrible mis mistake with Charles in forcing, trying to force him to be someone he wasn't uh, by sending him to Gordonstown. He's a very introverted person and he, he doesn't like team sports, doesn't play team games, doesn't like collective activity and is, has a kind of tortured, contorted soul. And, it, and that was made far worse by giving him an unsuitable education. So anyway, let me get back to the question. No, I don't think if if the, if a son had had the same qualities as as the queen, it would have would have been an effective kingship. But I do think there's a different quality that was attached to the queen because she was a queen and not a king. I think that this maternal quality, which she has so been so good at expressing now, obviously would have been lacking. And you don't feel the same way about a queen as you feel about a king. I, I think it, I think it would have been different. Do you think some of that harkens back to Elizabeth the first, and how she portrayed herself? Some of that, like motherly, like to the country. Elizabeth the first was a different kettle of fish altogether. She was um, incredibly gifted at statecraft. The country was divided between Protestants and Catholics. She had to wage a war against the Vatican. She freed the country from the yoke of the Pope. So there were great internal stresses, which she managed very well. And she was threatened by the Catholic powers of the time, not only the Pope, but by Spain and by Holland, and narrowly won a victory against the, the Spanish Armada. Um, so she, did, she had to do things that the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II never faced. Um, and most of all, she, she had a, a quality, quality of domestic culture, cultural life going on, which included, for example, towards the end of her reign, Shakespeare. So this little country of four million people produced an amazing queen and an amazing playwright and, and writers. So that was a difficult act to follow. You can't follow an act like that. It's impossible, but she did a great job nonetheless. All right. We have another question here. Can you, uh, what can you say about the tutelage between Sir Winston Churchill and the Queen? Um, I think um, the Queen's toughest job was to distinguish between the things that were good about what Churchill represented and the things that were bad. Churchill understood completely the political realities of diminishing world power, but he was still sentimentally attached to the British Empire, particularly to India, and greatly resented the fact that the, that the under the Labour government, they had negotiated the independence of India, which had to be broken up into India and Pakistan. That was a very difficult thing, which in fact, Lord Mountbatten was involved in because the Labour government at the time appointed him the last viceroy of India, so he had to preside over the end of India as part of the empire. Another complication to the relationship with the royal family. So there were parts of what Churchill represented which were old romanticism about the empire, which was no longer relevant, but there's a great deal that he represented that was positive, like how far you can lead a country and how far you have to wait for the country to get to where you, where you want it to be. I mean, there's a great quote about the current appalling prime minister of Britain, Boris Johnson, by a former conservative minister who said that he waits to see which way the crowd is running and then jumps to the head of it. Well, Churchill never did that. Churchill was always ahead of the crowd and I think he could, he handed down to the Queen a very important lesson of where you need to be in terms of where the country is. And that's that's one of the recurring th themes through my book. How well or how 
not so well. Queen managed to position herself at various times in these nearly 70, seven decades of being exactly where she should be in terms of being a head of state. We have a lot of questions about the role of the relationship between Queen Elizabeth and prime ministers. So I was wondering if you could speak on a few of them real quick. Um, Karen would like to know what was the relationship between the Queen and Margaret Thatcher and was it accurately depicted in the Crown? Oh, well, we, uh, I, I have written a piece on the Daily, I wrote a column on the Daily Beast about the truth between the relationship between the Queen and Margaret Thatcher. It, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, for any journalist to describe however close they are to the story because we know everything there is to know about Margaret Thatcher because not only did she leave a good record herself of it, but she was a thoroughly deeply reported and researched prime minister while she was in power and after she was in power. We know nothing from the other side really that's reliable about how the queen felt about Margaret Thatcher. And I deal with this in the book. I talk about the, the couple of occasions when newspapers claim to know that there was a deep breach between the prime minister and Margaret Thatcher. And there was a, one of these episodes was, was uh, portrayed in the crown when the queen, because of her affection for an attachment to the Commonwealth, was concerned that Margaret Thatcher was siding too closely with the apartheid regime in South Africa and therefore holding back the uh, independence of, of South Africa. And there was a truth to that and there was a tension in there to that. And um, Margaret Thatcher at the same time, when it came to the monarchy, she was totally a conventional upper middle class believer in the role of the monarchy, but she was also a believer in the, the power that she had as a prime minister. And she was um, an absolutist in the exercise of prime ministerial power. And it's astonishing that in fact, she came to power at a time when the country needed a, a very extensive trans social transformation. And that's a transformation she achieved at great cost and causing great, um, pain in some sectors of the population. And the Queen did care about that. So to that extent, and I think the last the last reference to the relationship between the Queen and Princess Margaret in the Crown is right in that when 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 um, Margaret Thatcher retired, the Queen gave her one of a rare honor. She she made a companion of honor, which was a is a thing that only the Queen can an award only the Queen can give to somebody and she gives it very rarely. So there was, a, so on the whole, I would say that the rela relationship as portrayed in the crown took some liberties. The most e egregious part of that portrait of <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher in the crown was the idea that she ended up at the queen's Scottish home in unsuitable cocktail clothes and was taken off by the queen to stalk a deer in, in these most <laughs> unsuitable clothes in a frock and high heels. That was a, a liberty that, that um, Peter Morgan, who writes The Crown, took with it. It was not true. It, it was a, I, I'll say this about what Peter Morgan does with The Crown so that you can refer it to all the, the way that he deals with it. He, um, he, stays within the, he stays within the facts of character pretty closely, but he doesn't stay within the facts of events very closely. He juggles events around and, and transposes things and sometimes um, puts things together that weren't together, makes them simultaneous or separates them when they weren't separated. In terms of the accuracy, I think the Crown's moved into a very interesting time now in relation to the Queen. The first two series of the Crown, the Queen was center stage all the time because she was the story. And certainly when the, she was the young Queen, it was a very dramatic part of the story and she completely commanded the, the narrative. And it was an amazing thing to watch. It was so beautifully staged and shot and acted, I must say, too. Claire Foy was an amazing, in, in, uh, amazing as the younger queen. Um, but as you know, now it's got to the new series, the queen is, is a middle-aged mother who's basically reduced to being a spectator as the younger member of the, members of the family create havoc. And, and particularly as Princess Diana appears and wreaks havoc in, among the royal family. 
and forever changes the appearance of it. So in that extent, Peter Morgan's got a problem because the central character is no longer the queen and she's reduced to a, a secondary role. She's been played extremely well by Olivia Coleman, but she's after all become somewhat matronly and less glamorous. While Diana has such commanding, compelling, charismatic, high watt glamour that you, she takes it away from everybody else around her, which is actually what happened at the time. Oh, thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, I have another couple questions on Prime Minister. We have a lot of questions coming in still. Um, Sigrid would like to know, did the Queen have a favorite Prime Minister beyond Churchill? I don't know and nobody else knows. If I guessed, obviously Churchill is, is, is the favorite. Um, I think she was very fond of Harold Macmillan. Uh, because he, he handled that problem about the change in the royal name. And he was a very paternal, mature, um, uh, avuncular prime minister, in the same way that Churchill was avuncular to the Queen, Macmillan was able to be avuncular too. And he was the one who had to manage granting independence to Africa. He was the one who coined the phrase, the wind of change is coming to Africa, and we have to recognise it. And he was the one, actually, he was the one who got the queen to do something which was one of the most courageous things she ever did. When they felt that um, Kwame Nkrumah, who was the president of the new state of Ghana in Africa, was leaning towards Moscow and away from the Commonwealth because um, the Soviet leader at the time, Nikita Khrushchev was, was trying to seduce African states to move over into communism. And President Kennedy was very alarmed about this. And he asked, he was very close to Macmillan, he asked Macmillan if he could get the Queen to go to Africa and do a state visit to Africa under very perilous circumstances when there was, there was real security questions. And the Queen stood up and did it. That story is told in my book. It was also told in the, very well in The Crown too. And the Queen and the Kruma danced on the dance floor, literally. And that was an amazing way in which Nkrumah was pulled away from communism back into the fold of the Commonwealth. So I would say that Harold Macmillan and the Queen were a wonderful combination together in doing things. He would be this, I'm sure, the second favorite of the Queen. Thank you. So you touched on it briefly about how Diana shook up the royal family, especially with the Queen. Um, Eileen would like to know, could you comment on the way the Queen handled Princess Diana's death? Um, this also goes into the question of prime ministers because Tony Blair was the prime minister at the time Diana died and he was the one who <clears throat> didn't coin but promoted the phrase, the people's princess. And that rubbed badly against the Queen because it implied that Diana was much closer to the people than the Queen was. That was the Im implication of the, of the people's princess. And it's true that Diana was much closer to the people than the Queen was. And the Queen did misjudge, badly misjudge, the overwhelming outpouring of adoration from the people over the death of Diana. And the Queen was very slow to acknowledge both the power of that and the implications of it for the royal family. Only re reluctantly did she return to London at the end of the five days before Diana's funeral and take part in the, in, in the funeral proceedings. And I think that that failure hung over her for a while afterwards. At the same time, she didn't like the way that Tony Blair and his chief aide, Alastair Campbell, took the credit for fixing the problem of arranging an appropriate funeral for Diana. And there's no doubt that Tony Blair liked to take the credit for that and deserved to take a lot of the credit for that because he did manage skillfully to arrange a, a funeral ceremony with Elton John and all these wonderful people opening up the doors of Westminster Abbey and sending that music out to the people in a, in a wonderful, amazing coming together of the country uh, in, in their sadness over this death. And of course, it, the person most damaged by Diana was, was Charles to this day, because um, Camilla Parker Bowles is really seen as, that, as the Diana killer, that his, his, 
his affair with Camilla so overshone and, and overshadowed and made impossible any hope that Diana had of saving that marriage, that whether she liked it or not, Camilla has become a villain. I don't think it's fair on her that she's become the villain. I think the villain all along was Charles. We have a lot of questions speaking of Charles, a lot of questions about Charles and his future role. Um, I'm trying to see if I can combine them all here. Do you think Charles will accept secession? Do you think Charles will get to secede to be king? Or do you think it'll be passed over him? Um, I've, got some, I've got some polling figures here, which are quite striking. A poll that was done recently on the popularity of Prince Charles is 32%. The Queen is around 80%. Prince William is 40%. He's going up. And the general sentiment is that they'd like Will to take over directly and leave Charles out. That can't happen constitutionally because Charles does have to take over. There's some feeling that when the Queen gets to the age of 95 this year in April, she might invoke the Regency Act and make Prince Charles the Prince Regent, which he would can't become king as long as the Queen is alive. So as long as the Queen lives, he would be ruling as the Prince Regent. And once she dies, he would then become the king. I don't, uh, I have no claim to know either way, but I, my feeling is that the Queen's not minded to do that because she's always taken the job very seriously. She has a very, high sense of duty and she really made it clear that she wants to go on doing that job until she feels she can't do it any longer. And she's enormously, she's an amazingly fit person. She, she's out riding horses even to this day. When you watch her move around, she's physically independent, doesn't need any support, doesn't need a stick. She's as mentally agile as ever. Someone who knows her very well told me that she still has a prodigious memory, total recall. Of everything so there's no reason in terms of physical or mental enfeeblement that she should give up to Charles so it comes down to whether she feels any sympathy for this poor devil waiting in the wings for so long that Charles is, to, is, a, is basically an 18th century figure and um, William is a 21st century figure so if Charles becomes king I think the monarchy goes over the cliff at a fast clip because it will seem so odd and so anachronistic after his mother to have someone who's so weird as Charles. Um, his education was part of the problem, as I said, but he um, he has a sense of he, what he calls his own convening power. Now, we know, as I said, we know nothing about the Queen's inner life. We know far too much about Charles's weird inner life. All these inner tortured feelings he had about Camilla, the way, way in which he communicated. So he would come to power with us having a kind of psych psychological roadmap of all that troubles him in a way that we've never had the same kind of thing with the Queen. That's an enorm enormous burden to follow. And I think that this thing he calls his convenient power, what it really means is he loves to have sycophants around him. He has weird, view, weird views about almost everything. So he recruits people who reinforces his views and he doesn't like people who challenges his views. So he would e end up with a crackpot assembly of people around him as advisors, which would be bad. So that's another reason why it'd be unsuitable. I have to add to a footnote to this, that part of the problem has always been the kind of people who are in the palace as in the palace as courtiers, and um, a kind of self-reelecting elite who are drawn basically from the upper classes. And the other thing I'd say about Charles is that if he were not the Prince of Wales, and if he were not the heir to the throne, he would be more clearly seen as what he really is, which is an upper class twit. He, he has all the characteristics of a of an over entitled, over indulged upper class twit that he wouldn't give a second glance to were it not for the fact he is the heir in line to the throne. Um, speaking of the future, what do you think the Windsor family needs to do after the Queen's reign to maintain their stature? Um, that was asked by Julie. Well, I think this, this has a bearing on the way they reacted to Meghan and, and Harry. Meghan and Harry are far more appreciated 
in this country than they are in the UK, for good reason is that they are, as I said about William, <clears throat> Meghan and Harry of the 21st century. There's a whole industry built up on the idea of a rift between Harry and William. It's what I call the raw rift industry. Um, and, and, they, and they have to keep it going. That's largely an artificial dispute. Um, there's no real <clears throat> permanent damage between Harry and William. After all, the Queen and her own sister, Margaret, were very different. Why shouldn't William and Harry be equally different? And so um, any, any view of the monarchy after the Queen has to relate to what happened to Harry and Meghan. They couldn't be the people they wanted to be and stay within the royal family. So they had to get out of the cage and they came here. And they are very, they're a very good advertisement for the best side of the royal family and that they are devoted to public works. So Harry wants to use his status as Diana's son and a royal prince to do good works, which he, which he will do. And that one of the most appalling pieces of hypocrisy was to complain that, that Harry and Meghan wanted to cash in with, the, um, with a kind of brand, the Sussex brand and make money. Now, let me remind you that Prince Charles was the first one to cash in. He has a royal brand and, and it, it's called Duchy Products, the Duchy of Cornwall. And it's got a brand, it's got a portcullis as a brand, and he sells things through a British supermarket chain called Waitrose, ranging, ranging from uh, pickled onions to um, potted crab to ginger biscuits. And he makes 20 million pounds, which is about $28 million a year out of this. So they can't turn around and complain about Harry wanting to use the his royal connection for good purposes, not to make ginger biscuits and pickled onions and, and potted crab, but to actually do good works. So that's another way in which there's a double standard applied, one standard to the rest of the royal family, one standard to Meghan and Harry. So I think that's unfair too. Thank you. We have so many questions coming in. I, there's, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to them all, but I highly recommend all of you checking out um, Clive Irving's book. There's a link once again that's in the chat for The Learned Owl if you'd like to purchase a signed copy. Um, the Learned Owl is our local independent bookstore, so I encourage you all to check it out. The book is fantastic and it was super interesting. Um, we have, I'm going to just choose one final question because I think that's all we have time for tonight. Um, someone would like to know why you chose the title The Last Queen for a book about Elizabeth. Um, that's a very good question. I chose the last queen because, partly because of what I said about there being, having been three, three great queens, Elizabeth I, Victoria, and Elizabeth II, and partly because there's no foreseeable queen in the line of succession. The line of succession is now all male. So it's like a bookend. Uh, I see the queen as a bookend, not only to a whole phase of the Windsor family in power, but She's a bookend to her own family's influence and role. And so it seemed to me in a very real meaningful sense, she is and will be forever remembered as the last queen in the line of English queens. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us this evening. We greatly enjoyed having you. It's been fun here. At, uh, talking to you all and I'm sorry that um, I couldn't go out, get around to giving more answers but the answers to every question are in the book I'm sure so there you go. <laughs> once again I encourage you all to check it out thank you all so much for coming tonight and we look forward to seeing you again at our next program bye everybody